Hello, Crazy Logics here. I've got a little Kenwood KAC 5206. It's just a little bridgeable power amplifier. It says max power 400 watt. Forget that. I mean, it's a standard Craftsman screwdriver and it's only barely as long as that. So that's definitely max power downhill with the wind behind it kind of thing. Uh, so uh, we're going to start this out by doing the correct tests, the way you would troubleshoot an amp, uh, I already kind of know what's wrong with this one, but I want to go over it, because uh, a lot of people have a hard time troubleshooting an amp to see what's wrong with it. So the first thing I always do is I give it a visual inspection, uh, you know, check, get my little fuse puller out, get my multimeter. Set on continuity, make sure the fuse is good. You know, inspect all the uh, terminals, whether they're uh, set screw style or whatever. Make sure there's no wires in there, little frayed wires or anything. Make sure when the fuse goes in and out that it's really good and tight, uh, however the fuses are, if it has one. Uh, the reason why you want to check that fuse, even though you can see it is, is on, I've seen some of the little 15 ampers and stuff. Uh, just blow through a thin part so little that it was hard to see without you really looking at it close and magnifying. So checking it with your multimeter always makes a difference. You need a good multimeter. Don't get one of those Harbor Freight freebies that you get a coupon for. Or those don't work. Spend 20, 30 bucks and get a decent multimeter that's got a continuity uh, diode test that beeps at you. You'll want it. So I got a uh, old resistor here that I've had forever so much so long that I've wore the the numbering off of it that tells what it is. But it's a 240 ohm uh, five watt resistor, and you need something, you know, 150 ohm, 300 ohm, somewhere in that range, kind of high wattage. You're going to be using this to drain capacitors uh, instead of dead shorten them. It's better to run them through a cap, and even on uh, big amplifiers with. Uh, uh, high high rail voltage and stuff. I can stick this on and and it won't get hot, but it'll uh, it'll softly drain those caps instead of suddenly draining them. Which you know, sudden shocking drains like shorten them. Uh, not only could cause pops and sparks, but uh, can can is hard on the uh, ca caps. So <laughs> always just use one like this. Get you something like this. We're gonna go between the battery and ground terminals. And we're just going to leave it there, hooked up underneath there, and we'll give it a few seconds. And what we're doing is draining the power supply filter caps, because we want to check the power supply. Without taking it apart, we can check it with our multimeter. So you need your positive and negative probes with it set on continuity. And in continuity mode, uh, this is going to put out about 3 volts in your multimeter. Uh, a very, very low amperage. You're going to want to put the black on the ground and the red on the positive, and you're going to watch this meter, and it's going to beep at first because uh, it's, going to, uh, it's going to see the caps as a kind of a short because uh, it's pulling all of the voltage down to charge those caps. Uh, but then you'll see a number start rising, and then it'll come all the way back up to this one, just like if it goes to zero when it's dead, you'll see that number come, see how that number came up? And then it ended up being a one. So let's watch this. We're going to put this on the ground. And this there. That didn't beep, but that's good. And you're going to see the number climbed all the way to one. So we'll do that again. You jump back up to one real quick. That means if it'll get all the way back up to, to, to it's reading three volts is what it's doing. Uh, that normally means that the caps and the power supply fets and some of the transistors, nothing in there is damaged enough to uh, pull uh, that voltage down uh, so it shouldn't be overcurrenting and blowing this uh, fuse. Sh now, that doesn't mean it won't blow the fuse because when you power it up there's not uh, dead output fets, but we're just considering the, the, the power supply part which is going to be here, you know, close to the power terminal. <laughs> I went ahead and taken a uh, a bunch of the screws out and stuff, but what this amp was doing uh, was pretty simple. You'd hook up the power, and I hooked up a test speaker after doing that, and, and after actually taking the bottom off and looking. So 
uh, well, I'll tell you what we do. Uh, continue the test. You would take the bottom off. Uh, so after you've tested that, you take the bottom off to get at, to the FETs and the FETs or transistors in the output stage. And so here's your uh, input uh, transformer for the power supply. And this uh, amp has two FETs. You can see that they are labeled Q109 and Q110. And then see these two that got D on them? Those are the diodes. So power is going to come in on one part of this FET. There's on the other side of this board, there's a uh, probably a 494 uh, pulse width modulation chip that's going to send pulses into these two power supply FETs. They're going to run through this transformer, which then is going to run through these uh, rectifier diodes. This is a double diode pack, each one, each way, uh, which then use these caps. This is the, the power, the input filter cap. These are the, This is the rail caps. But this is going to make the higher rail voltage, higher than the 12 volts that you're feeding it from your car battery. And then the input circuitry through the RCAs over here, which is all on the other side of this board, sends the audio signal to these output transistors. They use this higher rail voltage to produce uh, produce the music louder than what your regular 12 volt would. So to test FETs, we keep it in diode mode, and we touch one leg, and we touch the middle leg, and we touch the outer leg, and we're listening for a beep. Now you'll see my multimeter change up numbers, and then we do the others. If you hear a beep, keep holding it there, and if it starts doing that same capacitor charging thing, that's exactly what it's doing. It's charging the capacitor. So we're going to do it over here. And as long as that beep goes away and you see those numbers climb, you know that that is okay. Now, to test the rectifiers, it depends on which way they go because they'll either both the di that's got two diodes in it, and they're either both pointing in or both pointing out, and they share a common middle leg. So this one shares common middle that is actually needs to be the positive. And so each outside leg touching it with the black probe should show the same number. Now you put the black probe in the middle and they should go all the way up, charge that cap that these are hooked to, which is these caps. It'll charge that cap all the way up to a one. We'll just wait for it. Um, it's taking a while to get there. There's some issues with this amp, so it may not get all the way there. Uh, most of the time it'll go all the way up, but you can test it there. So now we know to put the black one on this one, and that should give us somewhere in the 430 range and put it on the outside there. Right, make sure your probes don't touch. <laughs> and we can test it the other way. And the number should climb. Oh, don't touch the probes. And the numbers should climb, and that's good. We're going to do the same thing here. We're going to test. We're going to test. Nothing. Nothing. And what we're listening for is if I touch these two and I heard this, and it didn't go away, we'd know this is dead shorted, and that would be part of our problem. So after checking all those, and those were all good in, in the amp, I went ahead and hooked up power and uh, hooked up the RCAs and I put a speaker on and I was going to test it at super low volume. I always go through and switch all the switches. So this one's got uh, uh, a, a low pass filter, switch all the switches. I turn all the gain settings. Uh, back and forth, back and forth, and then turn it down real low. Any other switches, turn all the features off, all the special filters, all that extra crap, you know, but we want to work these back because switches and pots uh, are notorious for uh, uh, getting dirty and then not working very well, getting noisy, getting scratchy. So just work them gently back and forth, switch the switches back, and then turn everything off and set the gains almost down to nothing. And then you can hook up your stuff. Well, I powered it up, and the nice little red Kenwood light would come on, and then all of a sudden it went off. And so it's like it's going into protection mode. 
Uh, so I tried a couple different things. I, I swapped. I only had one speaker hooked up on one side, so I thought, well, maybe this side's blown. So I hooked it up over here. It did a little bit better, but still went out over here. Uh, I try. I completely removed the speaker and was tr was just running the inputs. And as I would turn the volume up, coming into the inputs, the power would always go out. And so something was definitely wrong. Well, we couldn't find anything wrong with the outputs, and nothing was looking here. So I probed my uh, RCAs to look for signal and stuff. And then I started doing something I normally should have done before I started probing all that other stuff. And actually, before I even hooked power to it, is anytime you've got an amp out here, you just need to wiggle components. Anything that's big, make sure it doesn't feel off. Because, you know, when you ain't got no power to it, nothing is happening. And all those feel good. Except when I got to these resistors, and these are the bias uh, output resistors, I believe they're called. Uh, this one kind of felt sproingy, and this one felt real sproingy. Those two felt okay. <clears throat> so I was like, uh-oh, something feels like that's broken there. And let's go ahead and pull. I just put that one screw in there. So I had to get my uh, handy dandy little pliers. Uh, these were all nice. Once you took the screws out, they popped out real nice. I had to take these and get a hold of it and just give it a little wiggle to break the uh, uh, thermal compound bond so that I could get this board to come out. And you can see the thermal compound there. So let's set that out of the way. And so you're not going to be able to see this up close unless I try doing something special. I have acquired a USB microscope. And I'm going to try. I'm turn it on here. Let me find the button. And I'm going to switch the view, but i got to get it uh, where I need it first. I have to get my little magnifier out here and find it myself. Because I really want to show you. Okay, it's that one and that one. All right, so I can see that one right there. So let's switch to my magnifier view and see if I can get this to focus in. Oh, we are off a little. Ah, there we go. So, if you look at a good solder joint, oh, I'm going to turn on my overhead light to see if that helps. No, it might help in the repair stuff. Uh, so, if you look at a good solder joint, let's see if I can get the focus a little bit better. That's about as good as I can get. It's a cheap microscope, but uh, I'm going to get a pointer here. So, a good looking solder joint normally will be shiny all the way around. Uh, and you can see other solder joints here. But something I want you to notice, can you can you see this slight discoloration of a circle around? This is on one of the FETs. Uh, this one doesn't seem to have that circle. This one's got a little circle around the leg. Now sometimes that can be the light reflecting off of it. But let's pop back out here for a second. You know, if you use a magnifier or a good magnifying uh, set of eyes and stuff to look down uh, and get up close, it really helps. Uh, but what I want to show you is that little resistor, one of them that I said, oh, that's not very good. Here is one leg and here is the other. And notice what that's doing. It has broken the solder joint. Well, we have resistors like that on both sides. And notice how much it can float in that hole. Well, that's all on the output. So when you try to power this amp up, this thing's going to be bouncing around in that hole and not making any connection except for maybe just a tight, slight touch. And that is in a couple places on this board. And that is caused by vibration damage. So if you look, these resistors are up here and 
if this amp was mounted to a speaker box and that speaker box was booming all the time, it's going to make these little suckers wiggle. And it can also make FETs wiggle that aren't on there. It can make capacitors wiggle. And that's why you'll, a lot of times in amps you'll see uh, a goob of what looks like silicone or something uh, holding between a pair of caps like these. And then maybe they'll put a glob onto the board to help glue bond some of these things on. So that if they get vibration, which cars and trucks vibrate, uh, it'll be less likely to vibrate and either break the lead or do what we've seen there, which is make it so that, I don't know if you can see, I'm going to turn this light off, see if that helps. Uh, if I wiggle this, and you really focus and pay attention right there, you can see it wiggle. You can see it wiggle, and I can put the mic on, and that, that, that's the same over here. So what I'm going to do with this board is uh, I'm going to go through and hey, you fix those solder joints, but I'm going to look at everything with my little viewer. Uh, I'm going to fire up my fume extractor, which is noisy, so I won't record that part. And I'm going to take my soldering iron and I'm going to go over this board everywhere I think I see. Everywhere, obviously, that there's a crack in the solder. Those were glaringly huge, obvious. But anywhere, even like when I was showing you on that FET, where it looks like it may have got a little bit of stress already. I'm just going to go ahead and give that a little extra reflow, keeping keeping that doing. And I'm going to go over this whole backside of this board. Um, here's that chip. Let's see. It is a yep TL494. That is the uh, chip that drives these uh, the the, tra the power supply transformers or power supply FETs into the transformer to raise the voltage up. So, anytime you're uh, uh, troubleshooting an amp, like I said, those are the steps. I check everything. I check the fuse. I do the, the input power supply test. I remove the back cover. I get to all the things. And if nothing else is gone, then I don't mind to power it up. But I forgot to mention, and it's a big thing, to go and touch and make sure things are wiggled. Work your switches and your pots, uh, and then you can troubleshoot from there. Uh, if you've had an amp that's died and you had it mounted to the speaker box there's a chance you might and you've had it on there for a while you might find the same thing but this one's definitely vibration damage the fact that it would come on and would try to play and then would would, would shut off go into protect uh, would protect itself tells me that I probably besides those output resistors very much needing it I've probably got some other places that might be done here uh, what I will do is after I'm done soldering all those up uh, I will probably give these a, a bit of a bend and maybe uh, glue a little plastic rod or something uh, to, uh, to give those some kind of support. Uh, probably dab it here and dab there and then dab some on the board here to help support that stuff because I know this thing's already been subject to some vibration but I will, like I said, run my fume extractor and just spend some time really working. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, I seen one other, and I think it's a biggie. Yeah, let's let's pull the microscope back in. <laughs> so this ain't going to be helping it either. This is another thing you'll see. Let's see if I can get that centered up right. Uh, let's go back to the microscope. That's the back of the fit. There's the trace. So this is the four FETs. These are the two power supply ones. Let's see if we can get, get it really good. Focus on there. So you're looking at that, and those, those aren't shiny anymore, so they've gotten hot. Uh, you see how the rest of the solder is shiny, so I'm definitely going to reflow those. Same with those. This little sucker's been pushed pretty hard. Um, nice thing about having a little bit of a microscope, you can look down and, and see some things. Uh, but there's a big one coming up here. Let's wiggle these. Come over here. Uh oh. There's been some other wigglage. And it's cracked that solder joint. And I'll bet it's cracked the trace. 
underneath there too. So I'm going to have to get a little bit of wire of decent size. It can be like an old fet leg that's cut off and soldered across there. Get it pushed down in and redo that solder joint because I'll bet where it's cracked this solder right here. You can see that my, my pick gets caught in the crack. It's cracked it so bad. I wonder if I wiggle it. Nope, that's good, but uh, that needs to be done. So I'm looking for all the things like that uh, all over this board. You know, that, the, uh, all these little things where, they're, where it's broke off and no longer getting continuity, and I'll probably check you know, see, see how you're getting this little stress ring? All this thing has been, a, you know, anything that's got a tall component could be suspect. And so I'm just going to go through and solder and do all that. And I may use the meter to uh, test and make sure I got continuity through everything and stuff. But I'll bet after dang near reflowing this board, and I'll just do it by hand with my soldering iron. Uh, I'll bet this thing will work perfect. I can put it all back together and uh, it'll be a nice little lamp for somebody. So uh, once I get all the solder connections done, uh, we'll give it a test and uh, we'll, I'll come back. Uh, I'll start the video back up then. All right, see you in a bit.